Hypothetically, if history is some algorithm, and there's a normal range of behavior, and then there's some weird shit that's outside the pale of normal, and then there's the Crusades. Wow. The Crusades were a 200-year movement of tens of thousands of Western Europeans who traveled more than 2,000 miles to seize the Holy Land, a region with no strategic significance that most of them barely knew anything about and almost certainly cost more than it gave them back. It completely defies the mind unless you remember this was a society where heaven and hell were as real as a physical world, and a culture that encouraged insane honor and courage, and the median age was 21. I almost view the Crusades as a combination of the dumb but manly things teen guys do when they're drunk, and a teen viral internet trend. I'm gonna be real with you guys, it was a bloody shock the Crusades were near as successful as they were in our timeline. A tiny group of Europeans 2,000 miles away from the recruiting grounds were able to hold onto a stretch of land for 200 years against unbelievable numerical superiority. The Crusades, if anything, were a demonstration of just how overpowered knights were with medieval technology. But this channel has to live with the irony of going into completely unrealistic scenarios and then having me explain their economics in a deadpan fashion. So let's think about what if the Crusades actually had succeeded? What if the Christians held onto the Holy Land? That is a question of this alternate history. What would its effects on borders, culture, wars, demographics, and the rest of history be? That is the question of this alternate history. Before we get started, the Crusades are one of the most propagandized moments in history, and are somehow still controversial a thousand years later, because Christian-Muslim relations haven't gotten a hell of a lot better since. And whenever I talk about the Crusades, a torrent of misinformation just appears in the comments, and so to get this video through, give me a literal minute to dispel some myths. The Western left and Islamists are in a sort of historical battle with the Western right about how the Crusades are presented, with both sides saying the other's faction were brutal thugs and that their side was inherently the noble one. The truth is that both sides were at roughly the same level, both morally and technologically. The Crusaders did brutal massacres in the First Crusade, but the Muslim Mamluks burned those cities into a pulp in the 13th century. The Muslims were tolerant of religious minorities, but so were the Crusaders when they realized just how outnumbered they were, just using the pre-existing Muslim frameworks of tolerance. Both sides when they were angry did pogroms against their religious enemies. Similarly, there's this idea that the Muslim world was much more technologically advanced than the Western Christian. That was true in the First Crusade, but then the West went through an incredible developmental revolution and had caught up by around 1200. The two were at roughly the same level, with the West slightly better at stuff like arms manufacturing and naval technology, and the Muslims were better at medicine and civic engineering. As a medieval history nerd, it always annoys me how poorly represented the Middle Ages is, with stereotypes and myths taking the place of facts. I partially sympathize. It's hard to learn about different topics and often difficult to know where to even start. Well, Magellan TV is a solution I would highly recommend. Founded by filmmakers, Magellan TV is the richest and most varied history content available anywhere, with topics on things ranging from the World Wars to Rome, crime, the Stone Age, or biography, as well as a huge amount of non-historic content as well. I was a huge fan of their TV show Gods and Monsters with legendary British comedian Tony Robinson. It talks about what superstitions the inhabitants of Britain used to believe. A really cool episode talked about how the last man he bared the stake in his neck to prevent vampirism was in 1830s downtown London. It's streamable on basically everything everywhere and is available in 4K. And if you click on the link in the description, you get one month free, which I think is a pretty good deal considering quarantine. People tend to focus on the First and Third Crusades, or the sexy ones, and tend to forget all the ones that came after, the other six crusades that kept going for another hundred years. That's mainly since we're in the West, and the others were either completely pathetic or the Fourth Crusade, which is a goddamn disgrace, which destroyed the Byzantine Empire, which is one of the most advanced civilizations of the time. <sighs> However, I find the Seventh Crusade the one actually most likely to have succeeded. The Seventh Crusade was an almost entirely French one, led by the Saint King Louis IX of France. They tried to seize wealthy Egypt and use that as a base to retake the Holy Land. 
This dealt with one of the main issues of the Crusades, in that the Holy Land was relatively poor and an unimportant region in the Muslim world, being surrounded by wealthy and populous Syria and Egypt on both sides, meaning that the Muslims were continually able to reattack the Crusaders who didn't have a strong local power base. In our timeline, the Crusaders seized the Egyptian port city of Damietta, but didn't take the flooding of the Nile for granted, which meant they were stuck in an island in the Nile's flood for six months. This was unfortunate for them, since they actually attacked Egypt when it was in a weak state, right when the Sultan had died and the Egyptian Mamelukes were busy dealing with the Schwarzman invasion of the Holy Land. In this timeline, the Crusaders are able to take the Nile into account and invade at exactly the right time. They take the Mamelukes off guard at their weakest, using their heavy cavalry charge to destroy the Mameluk royal army and seize Cairo. The Mamelukes were a tiny Chechnyan ruling elite that oppressed the native population, and so when their main army would be destroyed, their entire regime would collapse. The issue with most crusades is that they had no clear leadership, with the crusaders coming from petty nobility from all over Europe, and so no one knew if the Duke of Brabant had any precedence over the Duke of Austria, and so places like the Kingdom of Jerusalem were quite decentralized, with the king only really being a figurehead. However, this crusade was practically only French, with the King of France's vassals being the majority of its members. France was one of the most centralized medieval European countries, with a strong central bureaucracy and the crown having enormous wealth and power. Louis IX would technically turn Egypt into an independent kingdom based out of Alexandria, but it would really become a part of France with agents of the king moved in from Paris. Jerusalem was fairly unimportant and weak in the Muslim world, and so with all of Egypt's wealth, the French would seize it, connect it with the Crusader states that survived in the Levantine coast, and these states would ally with the French Crusaders against the Muslims, but not immediately willing to become part of France would keep a certain distance. Before this Crusader kingdom would reach its 20th birthday, it would face a threat that might have wiped it off the face of the earth. The Mongols are alternatively the exception to every historical rule. The Mongols invaded the Holy Land in our timeline, but were beaten by the Mamluks at the Battle of Ain Jalut. This was a spectacular victory, and the Mongols almost always won all their battles, even when horribly outnumbered. But here, the Mongols and Mamluks were evenly matched. The big thing was the Mongols only sent a token force to conquer Egypt since their leader had died. Whether or not the Crusaders would have beaten the Mongols is one of the toughest calls I've ever made in alternate history. In favor of the Mongols is that the Mamluks and native Egyptians were both Sunni Muslims, meaning they would better be able to exploit Egypt than the Crusaders would be. Also, although the Crusaders and Mamluks fought in roughly similar manners, the Crusaders were slightly more reliant on heavy cavalry, which the Mongols could regularly butcher by driving them into the desert and then riding circles around them wearing them out with arrows until nothing remained. On the other hand, both the Crusaders and Mamelukes depended on recruiting their warrior classes from thousands of miles away. But, the decisive factor was how many high-quality castles the Crusaders built. European knights were expected to build castles to support their control, meaning the Mongols might be able to defeat the Crusader armies in the field, but to solidify their control of Egypt, they would have had to have seized dozens of castles, which they didn't have the men to do. Similarly, the Crusaders, knowing how strategic the region would be, would have fortified the shit out of the Suez Isthmus, thus making it impossible for the Mongols to seize without a multi-year campaign. After the Mongol threat, there wouldn't be many important competitors to the French Kingdom of Egypt, mostly because the Mongols had already nuked the important parts of the competition. Egypt is a pretty easy area to oppress, with Egypt never having a native-run regime in the 2,500 years between 521 BC and 1950 AD. I've never even heard of an Egyptian peasant revolt after the Persian Empire, to be honest. So the Crusaders likely have been able to rule Egypt without much local resistance. Egypt was quite wealthy, like India, by certain metrics, and France would try to hold onto it for survival. A French dynasty was in control of southern Italy and Sicily at this time, and was part of the House of Anjou, which were a powerful French noble family. The French royal family would marry into the House of Anjou to gain control of southern Italy to solidify their control of the Mediterranean. The French in this era really weren't a mercantile people. Most of the ocean-going trade around France was owned either by the English, Italians, or Germans. In our timeline, while mostly French and German crusaders were wasting blood and money and trying to seize the Holy Land, the Italians were making a killing. 
The Italians made the boats that transported crusaders to the Holy Land, and reaped all the trade benefits that came with that. Even after the Crusades, all the Muslim regimes of the late medieval Mediterranean were economically dependent on the Italians, with the Western Mediterranean dependent on the Genoese, while the Eastern was on the Venetians. Something similar would happen in this timeline, with the French forging an alliance with the Venetians to exploit Egypt, with the Venetians operating as the main merchants. Italy in this era was unbelievably wealthy, mostly due to controlling the Mediterranean's trade. For example, the city of Florence made more annual revenue than the entire nation of England. France would want to control the Mediterranean use its enormous population and military might to subdue these small Italian states and take their wealth and influence. They would also try to unite all of France and drive the English into the sea, who were in control of the southwestern part of the country. This would be this timeline's Hundred Years' War, as France would be busy fighting a two-front war in both France against the English and to subjugate northern Italy. Venice would initially be their ally in this, but as the French would take over more of the north of Italy, the Venetians would backstab them rather than becoming too powerful, and try to split off Egypt as an independent state. This would likely fail as the French knights would butcher the Italian infantry under the Egyptian sun. The balance of power would be driven truly off-kilter by this French dominance, with Aragon, or modern Catalonia, a state with Mediterranean ambitions siding against them. Castile, Aragon's main rival, would meanwhile side with the French, while Portugal, who was fighting its war of independence against Castile, would side with England and Aragon. With Aragon and Portugal working against Castile, Portugal and Aragon would likely annex parts of Castile. The Holy Roman Empire would likely intervene against the French to keep the French from seizing northern Italy. However, the Holy Roman Empire was barely a country at this point. It's truly difficult to say how this war would end. On one hand, France would be wealthier from the seizure of Egypt, and with such a wide colonial empire, France would be forced to develop a professional army earlier, which was a huge breakthrough for them in our timeline in the Hundred Years' War. On the other hand, France would be truly overstretched by fighting on so many fronts. England was a nasty son of a bitch to be fighting in the Hundred Years' War, and nearly won in our world. Medieval monarchies were so weak that a France that had taken too much strain could have easily fallen apart and have been conquered by England. I think the most likely option is the general medieval average of bizarre deus ex machinas and general entropy would seize power. Castles were so powerful before cannons that the natural trend was towards disintegration of empires and towards geographically definable borders with weak central governments. If I have to make a weak guess, I would say that Aragon seizes southern Italy, France is forced to put a relative on the Egyptian throne, and Egypt becomes a Venetian protectorate. England does not conquer France and is driven into the sea. An appropriate comparison would be the Italian Wars at the turn of the 16th century, a lengthy slogfest that had little clear ending or victors worth mentioning. The Latins would likely be driven out of power by the Turks. We often forget that around 1500, the Ottoman Turks are the most professional, advanced, and generally best military on Earth. The Turks would be much closer to their supply base than the Westerners, and were better able to implement cannons and muskets, which could destroy the Crusader castles, into their militaries earlier than basically anyone. Egypt would become a Turkish possession. The Egyptian and Levantine economy and society would be in much better shape. The Mamelukes were rapacious thugs by all accounts, and ruined the Egyptian economy. After the Black Death, they prevented the peasants from moving into the cities and creating a capitalist market economy, which strangled the cities in manufacturing. They turned Egypt into an economic colony of Italy and exported raw goods in exchange for Italian manufacturers. They raised taxes to a level not useful for productive labor and basically did everything they could to degrade Egypt's economic development. The Levant is a different story, where the Mamelukes purposely destroyed the pre-existing cities like Jaffa, Tripoli, etc., since they were the Crusaders who continue to use them as bases. These cities were thousands of years old, and they basically depopulated this whole region. Say what you want about the Crusaders, but they did none of these measures. The worst thing the Crusaders would do is ensurf the native populations and give Italian manufacturing preference. This would hurt this region, but not to the same extent as the Mamelukes. Egypt and the Levant, to a much lesser extent, would remain wealthy centers of Islam. The Islamic world after the Black Death went through a series of nasty anti-Jewish pogroms, and Crusader Egypt, looking for a useful ethnic minority to oppress the native Egyptians with, would invite the Jews from the Islamic world to migrate to Egypt. This is similar to how Poland became a haven for Jews from Western Europe that had recently been kicked out by those governments. 
and this would result in a boom in Egypt's economy and intellectual life. Italian merchants had used a connection to the Red Sea from Egypt to adventure in the Indian Ocean and the like, but the Turkish seizure of Egypt would still end this. The Italians dominated the Egyptian spice trade in our timeline while Egypt was run by the Muslims, so not much would change. The Age of Exploration was more caused by the Spaniards and Portuguese being cut out of this pre-existing trade system than anything else. France with a history as a naval power would put more emphasis on colonial affairs in this timeline and less on continental wars. With more of a tradition of a Mediterranean empire, it seems plausible that France would colonize the Maghreb coast in the 16th century, which Spain nearly did in our timeline, but was narrowly prevented from. Similarly, France might have been more active in colonizing areas in the New World. What if Altist, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please comment, like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content. Also, check out my Patreon that's got lots of cool maps and the first two chapters of my history of the world. And as always, thank you very much and have a great day.